Part two of The Lees of Happiness. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Laurie Ann Walden. The Lees of Happiness by F. Scott Fitzgerald. Part two. Chapter four. A week later, Harry appeared at Marlowe, arrived unexpectedly at five o'clock and, coming up the walk, sank into a porch-chair in a state of exhaustion. Roxanne herself had had a busy day and was worn out. The doctors were coming at five-thirty, bringing a celebrated nerve specialist from New York. She was excited and thoroughly depressed, but Harry's eyes made her sit down beside him. "'What's the matter?' "'Nothing, Roxanne,' he denied. "'I came to see how Jeff was doing.' Don't you bother about me. Harry, insisted Roxanne, there's something the matter. Nothing, he repeated. How's Jeff? Anxiety darkened her face. He's a little worse, Harry. Dr. Jewett has come on from New York. They thought he could tell me something definite. He's going to try and find whether this paralysis has anything to do with the original blood clot. Harry rose. "'Oh, I'm sorry,' he said jerkily. "'I didn't know you expected a consultation. "'I wouldn't have come. "'I thought I'd just rock on your porch for an hour.' "'Sit down,' she commanded. "'Harry hesitated. "'Sit down, Harry, dear boy.' "'Her kindness flooded out now, enveloped him. "'I know there's something the matter. "'You're white as a sheet. "'I'm going to get you a cool bottle of beer.' All at once he collapsed into his chair and covered his face with his hands. "'I can't make her happy,' he said slowly. "'I've tried and I've tried. This morning we had some words about breakfast. I'd been getting my breakfast downtown. And, well, just after I went to the office, she left the house, went east to her mother's with George and a suitcase full of lace underwear. "'Harry!' And I don't know. There was a crunch on the gravel, a car turning into the drive. Roxanne uttered a little cry. It's Dr. Jewett. Oh, I'll... You'll wait, won't you? She interrupted abstractedly. He saw that his problem had already died on the troubled surface of her mind. There was an embarrassing minute of vague, alighted introductions, and then Harry followed the party inside and watched them disappear up the stairs. He went into the library and sat down on the big sofa. For an hour he watched the sun creep up the patterned folds of the chintz curtains. In the deep quiet, a trapped wasp buzzing on the inside of the window pane assumed the proportions of a clamor. From time to time another buzzing drifted down from upstairs, resembling several more larger wasps caught on larger window panes. He heard low footfalls, the clink of bottles, the clamor of pouring water. What had he and Roxanne done that life should deal these crashing blows to them? Upstairs there was taking place a living inquest on the soul of his friend. He was sitting here in a quiet room, listening to the plaint of a wasp, just as when he was a boy he had been compelled by a strict aunt to sit hour-long on a chair and atone for some misbehavior. But who had put him here? What ferocious aunt had leaned out of the sky to make him atone for what? About Kitty he felt a great hopelessness. She was too expensive. That was the irremediable difficulty. Suddenly he hated her. He wanted to throw her down and kick at her, to tell her she was a cheat and a leech, that she was dirty. Moreover, she must give him his boy. He rose and began pacing up and down the room. Simultaneously he heard someone begin walking along the hallway upstairs in exact time with him. He found himself wondering if they would walk in time until the person reached the end of the hall. Kitty had gone to her mother. God help her, what a mother to go to! He tried to imagine the meeting, the abused wife collapsing upon the mother's breast. He could not. That Kitty was capable of any deep grief was unbelievable. He had gradually grown to think of her as something unapproachable and callous. 
She would get a divorce, of course, and eventually she would marry again. He began to consider this. Whom would she marry? He laughed bitterly. Stopped. A picture flashed before him, of Kitty's arms around some man whose face he could not see, of Kitty's lips pressed close to other lips in what was surely passion. God, he cried aloud. God, God, God. Then the pictures came thick and fast. The Kitty of this morning faded. The soiled kimono rolled up and disappeared. The pouts and rages and tears all were washed away. Again she was Kitty Carr, Kitty Carr with yellow hair and great baby eyes. Ah, she had loved him, she had loved him. After a while he perceived that something was amiss with him, something that had nothing to do with Kitty or Jeff, something of a different genre. Amazingly it burst on him at last. He was hungry. Simple enough. He would go into the kitchen in a moment and ask the colored cook for a sandwich. After that, he must go back to the city. He paused at the wall, jerked at something round, and, fingering it absently, put it to his mouth and tasted it as a baby tastes a bright toy. His teeth closed on it. Ah! She left that damn kimono, that dirty pink kimono. She might have had the decency to take it with her, he thought. It would hang in the house like the corpse of their sick alliance. He would try to throw it away, but he would never be able to bring himself to move it. It would be like Kitty, soft and pliable, withal impervious. You couldn't move Kitty. You couldn't reach Kitty. There was nothing there to reach. He understood that perfectly. He had understood it all along. He reached to the wall for another biscuit, and with an effort pulled it out, nail and all. He carefully removed the nail from the center, wondering idly if he had eaten the nail with the first biscuit. Preposterous. He would have remembered. It was a huge nail. He felt his stomach. He must be very hungry. He considered, remembered. Yesterday he had had no dinner. It was the girl's day out, and Kitty had lain in her room eating chocolate drops. She had said she felt smothery and couldn't bear having him near her. He had given George a bath and put him to bed, and then lain down on the couch, intending to rest a minute before getting his own dinner. There he had fallen asleep, and awakened about eleven, to find that there was nothing in the ice-box except a spoonful of potato salad. This he had eaten, together with some chocolate drops that he found on Kitty's bureau. This morning he had breakfasted hurriedly downtown, before going to the office. But at noon, beginning to worry about Kitty, he had decided to go home and take her out to lunch. After that, there had been the note on his pillow. The pile of lingerie in the closet was gone, and she had left instructions for sending her trunk. He had never been so hungry, he thought. At five o'clock, when the visiting nurse tiptoed downstairs, he was sitting on the sofa, staring at the carpet. Mr. Cromwell? Yes? Oh, Mrs. Curtin won't be able to see you at dinner. She's not well. She told me to tell you that the cook will fix you something, and that there's a spare bedroom. She's sick, you say? She's lying down in her room. The consultation is just over. Did they, did they decide anything? Yes, said the nurse softly. Dr. Jewett says there's no hope. Mr. Curtin may live indefinitely, but he'll never see again, or move again, or think. He'll just breathe. Just breathe? Yes. For the first time, the nurse noted that, beside the writing desk, where she remembered that she had seen a line of a dozen curious round objects she had vaguely imagined to be some exotic form of decoration, there was now only one. Where the others had been, there was now a series of little nail holes. Harry followed her glance dazedly, and then rose to his feet. I don't believe I'll stay. I believe there's a train. She nodded. Harry picked up his hat. Goodbye, she said pleasantly. Goodbye, he answered, as though talking to himself, and evidently moved by some involuntary necessity. He paused on his way to the door and she saw him pluck the last object from the wall and drop it into his pocket. 
Then he opened the screen door, and, descending the porch steps, passed out of her sight. CHAPTER Five. After a while the coat of clean white paint on the Jeffrey Curtain House made a definite compromise with the suns of many Julys, and showed its good faith by turning gray. It scaled. Huge peelings of very brittle old paint leaned over backward like aged men practicing grotesque gymnastics, and finally dropped to a moldy death in the overgrown grass beneath. The paint on the front pillars became streaky. The white ball was knocked off the left-hand doorpost. The green blinds darkened, then lost all pretense of color. It began to be a house that was avoided by the tender-minded. Some church bought a lot diagonally opposite for a graveyard, and this, combined with the place where Mrs. Curtin stays with that living corpse, was enough to throw a ghostly aura over that quarter of the road. Not that she was left alone. Men and women came to see her, met her downtown, where she went to do her marketing, brought her home in their cars, and came in for a moment to talk and to rest, in the glamour that still played in her smile. But men who did not know her no longer followed her with admiring glances in the street. A diaphanous veil had come down over her beauty, destroying its vividness, yet bringing neither wrinkles nor fat. She acquired a character in the village. A group of little stories were told of her, how when the country was frozen over one winter so that no wagons nor automobiles could travel, she taught herself to skate so that she could make quick time to the grocer and druggist and not leave Geoffrey alone for long. It was said that every night since his paralysis she slept in a small bed beside his bed, holding his hand. Geoffrey Curtin was spoken of as though he were already dead. As the years dropped by, those who had known him died or moved away. There were but half a dozen of the old crowd who had drunk cocktails together, called each other's wives by their first names, and thought that Jeff was about the wittiest and most talented fellow that Marlowe had ever known. Now, to the casual visitor, he was merely the reason that Mrs. Curtin excused herself sometimes and hurried upstairs. He was a groan or a sharp cry born to the silent parlor on the heavy air of a Sunday afternoon. He could not move. He was stone blind, dumb, and totally unconscious. All day he lay in his bed, except for a shift to his wheelchair every morning while she straightened the room. His paralysis was creeping slowly toward his heart. At first, for the first year, Roxanne had received the faintest answering pressure sometimes when she held his hand. Then it had gone, ceased one evening, and never come back and through two nights Roxanne lay wide-eyed, staring into the dark and wondering what had gone, what fraction of his soul had taken flight, what last grain of comprehension those shattered, broken nerves still carried to the brain. After that, hope died. Had it not been for her unceasing care, the last spark would have gone long before. Every morning she shaved and bathed him, shifted him with her own hands from bed to chair and back to bed. She was in his room constantly, bearing medicine, straightening a pillow, talking to him almost as one talks to a nearly human dog, without hope of response or appreciation, but with the dim persuasion of habit, a prayer when faith has gone. Not a few people, one celebrated nerve specialist among them, gave her a plain impression that it was futile to exercise so much care, that if Geoffrey had been conscious he would have wished to die that if his spirit were hovering in some wider air, it would agree to no such sacrifice from her. It would fret only for the prison of its body, to give it full release. "'But you see,' she replied, shaking her head gently, "'when I married Geoffrey it was until I ceased to love him.' "'But,' was protested, in effect, "'you can't love that.' "'I can love what it once was.' What else is there for me to do? The specialist shrugged his shoulders and went away to say that Mrs. Curtin was a remarkable woman and just about as sweet as an angel. But, he added, it was a terrible pity. There must be some man or a dozen just crazy to take care of her. Casually, there were. Here and there someone began in hope and ended in reverence. There was no love in the woman except 
strangely enough, for life, for the people in the world, from the tramp to whom she gave food she could ill afford, to the butcher who sold her a cheap cut of steak across the meaty board. The other phase was sealed up somewhere in that expressionless mummy who lay with his face turned ever toward the light as mechanically as a compass needle, and waited dumbly for the last wave to wash over his heart. After eleven years he died in the middle of a May night, when the scent of the syringa hung upon the window-sill, and a breeze wafted in the shrillings of the frogs and cicadas outside. Roxanne awoke at two, and realized with a start she was alone in the house at last. CHAPTER Six. After that she sat on her weather-beaten porch through many afternoons, gazing down across the fields that undulated in a slow descent to the white and green town. She was wondering what she would do with her life. She was thirty-six, handsome, strong, and free. The years had eaten up Geoffrey's insurance. She had reluctantly parted with the acres to right and left of her, and had even placed a small mortgage on the house. With her husband's death had come a great physical restlessness. She missed having to care for him in the morning. She missed her rush to town, and the brief and therefore accentuated neighborly meetings in the butchers and grocers. She missed the cooking for two, the preparation of delicate liquid food for him. One day, consumed with energy, she went out and spaded up the whole garden, a thing that had not been done for years and she was alone at night in the room that had seen the glory of her marriage, and then the pain. To meet Jeff again, she went back in spirit to that wonderful year, that intense, passionate absorption and companionship, rather than looked forward to a problematical meeting hereafter. She awoke often to lie and wish for that presence beside her, inanimate yet breathing, still Jeff. One afternoon, six months after his death, she was sitting on the porch, in a black dress which took away the faintest suggestion of plumpness from her figure. It was Indian summer, golden-brown all about her, a hush broken by the sighing of leaves. Westward, a four o'clock sun dripping streaks of red and yellow over a flaming sky. Most of the birds had gone. Only a sparrow that had built itself a nest on the cornice of a pillar kept up an intermittent cheeping varied by occasional fluttering sallies overhead. Roxanne moved her chair to where she could watch him, and her mind idled drowsily on the bosom of the afternoon. Harry Cromwell was coming out from Chicago to dinner. Since his divorce over eight years before, he had been a frequent visitor. They had kept up what amounted to a tradition between them. When he arrived, they would go to look at Jeff. Harry would sit down on the edge of the bed, and in a hearty voice ask, "'Well, Jeff, old man, how do you feel to-day?' Roxanne, standing beside, would look intently at Jeff, dreaming that some shadowy recognition of this former friend had passed across that broken mind. But the head, pale, carven, would only move slowly in its sole gesture toward the light, as if something behind the blind eyes were groping for another light long since gone out. These visits stretched over eight years— at Easter, Christmas, Thanksgiving, and on many a Sunday, Harry had arrived, paid his call on Jeff, and then talked for a long while with Roxanne on the porch. He was devoted to her. He made no pretense of hiding, no attempt to deepen this relation. She was his best friend, as the mass of flesh on the bed there had been his best friend. She was peace. She was rest. She was the past. Of his own tragedy she alone knew. He had been at the funeral, but since then the company for which he worked had shifted him to the east, and only a business trip had brought him to the vicinity of Chicago. Roxanne had written him to come when he could. After a night in the city he had caught a train out. They shook hands, and he helped her move two rockers together. "'How's George?' "'He's fine, Roxanne. Seems to like school.' Of course it was the only thing to do to send him. Of course. You miss him horribly, Harry? Yes, I do miss him. He's a funny boy. He talked a lot about George. Roxanne was interested. Harry must bring him out on his next vacation. She had only seen him once in her life, 
a child in dirty rompers. She left him with the newspaper while she prepared dinner. She had four chops tonight, and some late vegetables from her own garden. She put it all on, and then called him, and sitting down together, they continued their talk about George. "'If I had a child,' she would say. Afterward, Harry, having given her what slender advice he could about investments, they walked through the garden, pausing here and there to recognize what had once been a cement bench or where the tennis court had lain. "'Do you remember?' Then they were off on a flood of reminiscences, the day they had taken all the snapshots, and Jeff had been photographed astride the calf, and the sketch Harry had made of Jeff and Roxanne lying sprawled in the grass, their heads almost touching. There was to have been a covered lattice connecting the barn studio with the house, so that Jeff could get there on wet days. The lattice had been started, but nothing remained except a broken triangular piece that still adhered to the house, and resembled a battered chicken coop. And those mint juleps! And Jeff's notebook! Do you remember how we'd laugh, Harry, when we'd get it out of his pocket and read aloud a page of material, and how frantic he used to get? Wild! He was such a kid about his writing. They were both silent a moment, and then Harry said, We were to have a place out here, too. Do you remember? We were to buy the adjoining twenty acres, and the parties we were going to have. Again there was a pause, broken this time by a low question from Roxanne. Do you ever hear of her, Harry? Why, yes, he admitted placidly. She's in Seattle. She's married again to a man named Horton, a sort of lumber king. He's a great deal older than she is, I believe. And she's behaving? Yes, that is, I've heard so. She has everything, you see. Nothing much to do except dress up for this fellow at dinner time. I see. Without effort, he changed the subject. Are you going to keep the house? I think so she said, nodding. I've lived here so long, Harry, it seemed terrible to move. I thought of trained nursing, but of course that'd mean leaving. I've about decided to be a boarding-house lady. Live in one? No, keep one. Is there such an anomaly as a boarding-house lady? Anyway, I'd have a negress and keep about eight people in the summer, and two or three if I can get them in the winter. Of course I'll have to have the house repainted and gone over inside. Harry considered. Roxanne, why, naturally you know best what you can do, but it does seem a shock, Roxanne. You came here as a bride. Perhaps, she said, that's why I don't mind remaining here as a boarding-house lady. I remember a certain batch of biscuits. Oh, those biscuits, she cried. Still, from all I heard about the way you devoured them, they couldn't have been so bad. I was so low that day, yet somehow I laughed when the nurse told me about those biscuits. I noticed that the twelve nail holes are still in the library wall where Jeff drove them. Yes. It was getting very dark now, a crispness settled in the air, a little gust of wind sent down a last spray of leaves. Roxanne shivered slightly. We'd better go in. He looked at his watch. It's late. I've got to be leaving. I go east tomorrow. Must you? They lingered for a moment just below the stoop, watching a moon that seemed full of snow float out of the distance where the lake lay. Summer was gone, and now Indian summer. The grass was cold, and there was no mist and no dew. After he left, she would go in and light the gas and close the shutters, and he would go down the path and on to the village. To these two, life had come quickly and gone, leaving not bitterness, but pity, not disillusion, but only pain. There was already enough moonlight when they shook hands, for each to see the gathered kindness in the other's eyes. End of The Lees of Happiness by F. Scott Fitzgerald